It's great to be here this morning. Uh, I've not personally been here for quite a long time. Wendy and I have been uh, very busy through the summer months. Uh, first of all in the USA, then into Mexico with a uh, gathering of leaders, some 20 new frontiers churches in Mexico now. And uh, then after that down into Zimbabwe where uh, quite remarkable things are happening. And uh, we're very encouraged to see that our foundations for farming which I hope you read about. I wanted to hold up a New Frontiers magazine, but I can't see any left downstairs, so I hope you got one last week or the week before. Uh, the foundations for farming that I think will change that nation, and we're hugely involved with that, so it was great to be there. And then went down into uh, Durban, Johannesburg, and Cape Town, and had the privilege, actually, of uh, speaking to 3,000 leaders in Durban, 2,000 in uh, Cape Town, and then lost my voice before I got to... Uh, uh, actually, Joe, then Cape Town, lost my voice, but got it back by the last night, so we had about a thousand there. So uh, there's a real progress. God's doing some wonderful things. And last weekend, actually, I was uh, in the east of England at what they call a Together Weekend. We're doing these all over the nation. And uh, Mike Betts, who leads the church in Lowestoft, had gathered the 20 churches that he works with uh, in that area. And uh, there were 1,200, went to Pontins Camp, and it was like a mini Bible weekend. And some of you may go back as far as uh, Stonely or further to Downs Bible Week when we first started. And we gathered at uh, Plumpton Racetrack, about 2,500 in those days. Uh, now they've got uh, a weekend where they had uh, 1,200. And not only uh, the 20 churches from that area, but also people from Poland, uh, people from Latvia. We, we're planting out English couple, husband, wife, and their four girls, little girls, all spoke in Polish to us. And they've gone out to plant a church out there, another church plant in Latvia. So when we first started New Frontiers, we didn't have any overseas work. We were just a few churches around Sussex. That's how we got started. And uh, maybe Kent and Surrey and a bit of South London. Uh, in fact, we didn't even call it New Frontiers. Uh, but that's how we got started. And uh, now we're seeing that multiplied all over the place as we saw this weekend, last weekend. And then next week, a gathering, actually in Holland this time, we usually host it in England, but gathering 30 guys uh, from Mexico, America, Russia, the Ukraine, Armenia, uh, Western Europe, uh, Kenya, Zimbabwe, uh, South Africa, Ghana, uh, all over. And uh, we're coming together all under the New Frontiers banner uh, for four days to pray about the future. And of course, part of the future is about what uh, will become lots of areas led by various apostolic leaders so that new frontiers can multiply all over the world, praise the Lord. And what started as one little group, you have many, many, many such. So it's great last weekend to see it in embryo there and really feel the impact. They raised over 50,000 in the offering, which I thought was magnificent, from 1,200 uh, for their vision. So all over the place, we're gathering such groups and uh, New Frontiers is getting ready for the next generation to pick up uh, the banner and run on uh, with church planting all over the world as people get ready to go. It's a thrill to just pray with this couple from Poland, hear their little girls speaking in Polish. You think, wow, people are going. It's not just Tom and Julie to Japan. People are going all over the world. And uh, God's on the move, and it's great to be part of that. Let me just mention some books. I was asked to do it, but I'm very happy to do it. Uh, Voice from the Hills is a book by Phil Greenslade. I really think it's magnificent. Phil has written some great books on leadership and other things, but this is a superb book, and it's about Jesus. Uh, from the Sermon on the Mount, he really goes through the Beatitudes so helpfully and uh, really helps us to see where the Sermon on the Mount fits and then takes us right through to the cross, and uh, he's got a chapter on each of the sayings from the cross. Uh, that Jesus, like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst, and you'll be with me today in paradise, and so on. Just terrific. I found it so stirring. I loved reading it. I'm looking forward to reading it a second time. I'm carrying it around with me with that in mind. Uh, it's a superb book, and uh, you don't want to read it too quickly. Uh, as I said in the review in the magazine, just, you just need to read it slowly. Let each chapter have its impact. Voice from the hills. And this morning's ministry is really... A, a real reminder that God knows that we're human, and so I just recommend that to you again. God knows you're human. He's, he knows our frailty. He knows how to carry us through, and so that would be a good follow-up book 
to this morning's ministry. Okay, we've been looking at Elijah when I have uh, from time to time preached. It's gone back over a couple of years now, I guess. This is the ninth study that uh, we've had in that. And uh, Elijah, we know, is a tremendous hero of the Bible. But we're told in James' epistle, chapter 5, Elijah was a man just like us. And uh, it's in this chapter you begin to really think, oh, perhaps he was, uh, because he looks like a superman uh, until now. He looks phenomenal. He can take anything on. Now suddenly, in this chapter, we begin to say, hey, he was a man just like us. He was vulnerable. He really hit some problems in this chapter. So we're going to read 16 verses uh, from 1 Kings chapter 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more if I don't make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. And said, it's enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, Arise, eat. He looked. Behold, there was a, at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. They seek my life to take it away. He said, go forth, stand on the mountain before the Lord. Behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was tearing the mountains and breaking it in pieces, the rocks uh, before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. They seek to take my life away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael, king over Aram, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehla, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We bless you for your presence. We thank you for the great truths we've been celebrating in song this morning. We love you, Lord. We're so grateful that you're our shepherd. We thank you you're our rock. We thank you you're everything that we need, Lord. And Father, we ask you in Jesus' name that you will please make this ancient story come alive to us. We pray in Jesus' name it may fortify us, stir us. I pray we may hear the voice of our Heavenly Father speaking right into our heart, re-engaging us, encouraging us, strengthening us. Holy Spirit, we look to you right now. Be our teacher, we pray. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we often hear a lot about stress these days and the 
toll that it takes on the modern population, how many people take days off work because, well, they're just stressed out, they can't cope. And it's good to know that stress is not a modern disease. It's not been invented in the 21st century. But here in the Bible, we read about one of its great heroes coming into a season of breathtaking stress, so much so that he completely collapsed and ran from his place of office. And so here we find in the Bible a character whom we've looked at for some weeks, and thus far he's been exemplary, he's been a phenomenal guy, he has shown us how, as it were, to live out in a post-Christian age what it is to be a voice into the generation, how to live by faith in the midst of it. But suddenly he collapses. Suddenly when Jezebel says to him, you'll die for that. You killed these prophets, my prophets, you'll be dead by tomorrow. And suddenly, Elijah has nothing left. And we see that this guy who was formerly uh, bold and courageous is suddenly fearful, he's terrified. He was preoccupied with God before. Now he's taken up with concern for himself. He was standing firm, now he's running scared. He was holding history, now he's irrelevant. He was visible and public. Now he's hidden under a tree in secret. He was clear about issues. Now he's completely muddled. A terrific transformation in this man. He's suddenly no longer the man he appeared to be. And I want us to see what is it? What caused him to collapse? What made such a phenomenal transition take place? Because these sort of stories are not irrelevant to us in our generation of stress and strain. And if we can learn secrets here, God, I believe, can help to fortify us. So first of all, I want to suggest that there came a moment when he took his eyes off of God. For the believer, as long as we keep focused on Jesus, keep drawing upon him, we can go through things. As we've sung in several of our songs this morning, that as we hold his hand, as we look to him, Peter could even get off of a boat and walk on a stormy lake with his eyes on Jesus. But when he saw the waves and the wind, suddenly he slipped. Suddenly he couldn't do it anymore. He got as near to Jesus. Jesus only had to put out a hand and get him. He could do it, but then he just kind of lost out. And, and, and suddenly he was vulnerable. Now we can know such times that you can walk with God, apparently, in a very good, peaceful Christian life, and then you get a sinkhole. You know, what's happening to me? What's going on in my life? I feel as though... I've lost the way. And here this happens to this great, great hero. What is it then that got his eyes off God? One or two things happened in the story before that may be a clues. One of them we notice in the previous chapter. He had been told when the, the fire fell from heaven and the prophets of Baal were proved to be crooks and cheats and nothing authentic at all. God said to Elijah, now wipe them out, destroy them. And Elijah went into that destroying the prophets of Baal and calling others to be involved to get rid of this terrible thing from the nation, this Baal worship, which included all kinds of wickedness uh, that God hated. So he's acting as God's representative against wickedness. But the Bible says this, be angry, but don't sin. That's a difficult balance. For many of us, we can't handle anger. We're most scared to go there. I think, oh, I don't want to be angry. Now, God is angry with things. God is furious about things. And we are to be angry. The Bible commands us, be angry. Some of us are a little too complacent. But sometimes when you get into anger, it can be a difficult area. You can get beyond what sometimes is called righteous indignation. When we feel, yeah, I represent God. A religious person who feels they represent God can be a pretty scary person, actually. When you click over, when you become a hostile voice. And what can happen, actually, is it's no longer what God feels. It's what actually your preference is involved. You don't like this stuff. I hate this. Get this out of our nation. And what can happen is what started, maybe, in simple obedience to God's requirement, clicks over into something, well, it's just you. And you're furious, and you don't like this, and you're going to handle it, and you're going to speak, and you're going to write letters. And, you're gonna... and what can happen is you just kind of lose God in it. You lose his breathtaking ability to handle judgment and yet somehow be handling it with mercy and we can lose God and sadly you can meet believers who are very het up about issues and you feel mm, I don't know that doesn't sound like God anymore maybe Elijah found it really hard to handle that 
That's only just a, a thing that's there. It's good for us, I think, to be instructed. Beware of that danger. There's danger there. There really is danger for you to become sometimes a one-issue Christian who fights against things. And you lost God somewhere. Beware of that. Another thing we can see about Elijah, what's happened here, is that after some years of secretly obeying God, hidden away, when he, he confronted Ahab initially, he said, it won't rain till I say so. It's like I've obeyed God, I've spoken to the king, now what, Lord? Go and hide yourself. Elijah goes and hides himself by the brook Cherith, and there's just a little stream, a little brook, and then the ravens come and feed him, and he's, he's living by faith. He's doing incredible steps of faith and obedience. No one's applauding. No one's saying, oh, well done, Elijah. Amazing. Then he goes to Zarephath. God says to him, go to Zarephath. There's a widow who will look after you. She'll provide food for you. He goes to Zarephath. Her son dies. He gives himself in prayer, raises him from the dead. No one's applauding. No one's saying, wow, you are impressive. It's just a woman and her little son. He's had no kind of public applause. Now, God says, go, show yourself to the king, now go. And the big battle, the gunfight at OK Corral, as we called it those many months ago, the conflict, the public, and suddenly, wow, he does call fire from heaven. <coughs> Prophets of Baal can't do it. He can do it. He can just, look, he just called, and look, wow, the fire's fallen. Not only that, he says, no, you better run, because the rain's coming. I am going to bring the rain. This is a big guy. He can stop the rain, he can start the rain. And then he says, hey, Ahab, you better get in your chariot, because the rain's coming. And then it says at the end of the last chapter, uh, Elijah hoisted up his clothes, and he outran the chariot. Whoa, this is pretty heady stuff. Watch out, I'm running faster than a chariot. I called down the fire. Elijah, you're amazing. It's a scary place. It's easier to be obedient when nobody knows than it is sometimes to get promoted, visible, applauded. Wow, that's the guy. He's the guy. A scary place to be. He's the musician. He's the sportsman. He's the, wow. You can be in a place of visibility and lose God. It's, it can happen. Here, suddenly, Elijah is not drawing on God. Was it suddenly self-consciousness, opportunity to shine? It's a dangerous place to be, just to note it. So here's a second danger. We don't know these things are true. I'm just saying, well, look, these things happened. Somehow he lost his ability to trust. The third thing I notice is that Jezebel threatened him. And somehow, there's like a satanic arrow penetrates his defenses. And suddenly, this, this wicked word, you will die tomorrow. And it comes with real satanic vitriol. It comes like a penetrating arrow. The Bible says, put up a shield against the fiery darts of the evil one. Fiery darts, because they used to take their arrows, plunge them into poison, and fire them. And they didn't just hit you, they poisoned you. They burn, and, and you think, why did she say that to me? That really hurt me. That can happen to believers. That, what that woman said, I've never been able to forget it. Or something, you know, my, even my mother said it to me when I was young. I've never got it out of my system. The guy I worked for, he said, you will never be. And somehow, it kind of, kind of poisoned. It got into me. I've never been able to get it out of my system. That, and sometimes, a fiery dart. And, and behind it is satanic. See, the Bible says that the devil comes to steal and kill and destroy. He's a liar. And words have awesome power. And Jezebel has awesome power. She, she's got satanic power. And when she speaks, it just cuts him up. And the guy is no longer courageous, standing against thousands, against the whole nation. Now one woman saying, that's the end of you. Ah, it got through to him. Suddenly, it penetrated his defenses. We need to understand that Satan has got some wicked instruments. You can find yourself lying in bed thinking, why did she say that? What was that all about? That's hurt me. I don't know, I've lost my peace. Is that really going to happen to me? Someone says some wicked thing over you. It can happen. We have enemies. He suddenly had nothing left when Jezebel gave the threat. 
Earlier, Ahab had said to him, you, you enemy of Israel, didn't touch him at all. Now, suddenly, he's defenseless. What happened? Well, I'd like to say that I think probably he was completely stressed out and therefore not ready for this tipping point, this last thing that tipped him over. Dear friends, we're in church this morning, got people sitting to your right and your left, and we can, you know, we're happy, singing, praising, but God knows where there's stress in your life, and that, that's just that one push. Ah, oh, that's it, I've had it. I've had it. I can't go any further. And that can happen secretly. That can happen in you. You don't even realize it's happening. There's no hint in the story of Elijah in the previous chapter, watch out, he's coming up for a fall. Not the slightest hint. But suddenly he's gone. And what are some of the things that happen? Well, we can see that he could easily have been fatigued even in the midst of excitement. Do you know that? You can be in a situation that's so exciting. And what happens is, well, the adrenaline is carrying you. And you don't even know because, well, there's so much happening. We're baptizing, we're doing this, that's going on, and we're there, and we're doing that, and we're doing that. And it's so exciting, it's so exciting, it's so exciting. And, and fire fell from heaven, and I prayed, and the rain came. And adrenaline is not actually building up your inner person. You are living by the surface excitement that fills your mind and fills your thoughts. And somehow you think the excitement can carry you and you're not actually making sure that you are putting your roots into God. And you can be fatigued without realizing it. Because you think, no, everything's great. And you hadn't noticed you were paying a price inwardly. You were not watching yourself. And here we see Elijah suddenly got nothing left. Yesterday's excitement wasn't enough to shield him from today's burnout. We need to learn about this. Jesus saw, at least the Old Testament, we find that manna was given every day. If you, if you kept the manna to the next day, it stank. They were told, take it every day, every day, every day. We need to live by the grace of God. We need to remain in him. As he said, remain in me, I in you. Keep abiding. Keep close. He's the provision. Because we find things will drain us. What, what sort of things drain us? Well, some are, I mean, perfectly valid. There's nothing sinful, as it were. Sometimes we think, oh, I've done something wrong. Well, what the Bible says here, virtue went out of Jesus. Virtue went out of him. In other words, there's, there's a kind of ramification. He's serving. People are reaching out, touching him, getting healed, and virtue went out of him. It talks about don't be weary in well-doing. You can come unstuck doing very well. You can come unstuck being very busy. There's no trace of evil here. It's just that he's got nothing left. And you can find that. You're just busy serving, weary in well-doing. You can just find you haven't got anything left. You're serving others, and suddenly you've not looked after your own soul. You need to be careful about it. Then next, disappointment. I mean, what kind of disappointment is this? He has closed the heavens and they have endured three years of famine. With all that happened as a result of three years of famine. They're barely surviving. Three years of famine. We hear about Kenya. We hear about months of famine. Three years of famine. That was what's happening there. And then the confrontation. The fire falls from heaven. I mean, what would you want? Baal and his prophets, a whole day dancing around the altar, cutting themselves, trying to get so nothing. Elijah just prays and let the fire fall and it falls. Not only that, let the rains come and they come. Whoa, I'm sure Ahab and Jezebel will fall down repentant. Oh, we fell on the wrong gods. We are so sorry. We, 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 we repent. You are so evidently knowing the real. Not at all. Jezebel is not in the slightest bit repentant. And she says, I'll kill you for that. You think, but this, that's fire. it's not high, fire from heavens, rain. I'll kill you for that. You know, disappointment is huge. You, when, you, when you are disappointed, when you set your heart on something, maybe, maybe you invited someone from work and they actually came to Alpha, they came to the first, you know, the meal, they really impressed, oh, very interesting speaker, this looks really good, I might, they never come again. I thought they were really interested. They tend to avoid you at the office now. I thought we were really making ground. I thought she was the one. I thought he was the one. I thought this was the job. I was sure we were going to get that house. There's all kinds of projects that you think, oh, 
I've set my hope on. You know, how's, how's it going? I'm really enjoying God. I think this is, I think this is, I've got my, and then nothing. It doesn't happen. Do you know what happens? When you hit disappointments, energy pours out of your boots. It's like you're standing there and somebody cut holes in your feet. Energy just goes. But disappointment drains you. You need to understand that. You need to understand when you set your heart on something and it doesn't happen, hey, that cost me. That wasn't free. We need to go back and make sure, Lord, I'm just coming back to you. We're not just putting up with this. We come to you. We trust you. You give, you take away. Blessed be your name. I'm going to keep trusting you. I'm going to keep believing. See, if we don't go there, if we say, oh, hallelujah, anyway. But inside, what was that all about? It costs you. Disappointments drain you. You need to understand that. That can come right into the home. It can come between husband and wife. You think, but I thought she would have, but she didn't. I came in the house. She's with the kids. Didn't even notice me come in. I know, I've been busy. It's been so lovely. If she'd have changed, looked a bit pleasant. And she's, and she's thinking, I've been with these kids all day. I mean, just speaking baby language. Don't touch that. No, do that. Oh, don't clean it up. You know. And he comes up. He's come to speak. A human being, an adult, and speak words to me. And he says, I've got the paper. What's on television? Is the meal ready? He, what? <laughs> he doesn't care. She doesn't care. That, you see, Satan, you must understand, Satan's very active. He penetrates. People talk about spiritual warfare. It's like some big cloud over a town. He's active, relational. Make him misunderstand. Make him misunderstand. Disappointment is painful. Hurts. You pay a price with that. Disappointment, leaders. You know, small group leader, you work hard. You do your preparation. You go to the small group leaders' preparation. You're training. You go to small group. Where are they? Only half of them turned up. And they're difficult ones, too. You think... This is it's hard life. Do I need this? You know, and no one seems to say thank you so much. You know, my wife had to really rush get the kids, so that we could have the meeting. And you think, oh, I don't know. Not appreciated is a drain. It takes energy. It's sapping your energy when you feel no one cares. I'm not really appreciated. It hurts, and it drains your energy. Some people actually are very good at forgiving others but very bad at forgiving themselves. I've, I, you meet lovely people like that. It's, oh, it's okay, didn't bother. No, it's fine. Don't, I don't give it another thought. It's okay. But on themselves, they don't do that to themselves. They don't let themselves off the hook. They do something, they think, oh, I didn't do it very well. I don't think I did that well. I better try hard. But to someone else, they say, no, it's fine. So, but to yourself, you won't. You're really hard on yourself. That's a very bad sickness to get into. Because you need to live in grace. You need to come to God continually, receiving forgiveness, mercy, refreshing. Because if you drive yourself, to, I must do better than this, you can get into a perfectionist thing that really, it's not right. You, you will not get refreshed. You need to be forgiving yourself. You need to be receiving mercy for yourself. And when I, Elijah thinks, well, what did I do wrong, maybe? Well, how come they didn't change? Well, I'm, I'm out of here. Something drained him completely. See, delays. The Bible says plainly, this is a verse you will not find on many fridges, all right? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hallelujah. Mm. See, it's not a verse you stick on the fridge, but it's true. Hope deferred. The thought, I thought, we threw, I thought we'd have sold the house by now. And I thought, oh, no, we're going to lose it? What's happening? Hope deferred. It just makes your heart sick. So you need to know, uh, my heart's sick at the moment. That really hurt. I need to get renewed. I need to get refreshed. I need to get to God. Because if I keep living on this, if I keep driving and the arrow on gas is going over and over and over and over and over and you're halfway over Dartford Bridge and you think, oh no, or even worse maybe in Dartford Tunnel, you think, oh, it's gone. You think, I'm going to blow the whole, oh, what have I done? Well, you didn't watch it. You're running on empty. You can run on empty in church life. You can be coming. So how's it going spiritually? Oh, mm. well, you're in church. Yeah, I know I'm in church. Well, our life's real. I'm a church, really. The kids and the cogs, they love it. My wife, you know, I'm just, I'm ticking over. You know you are. You know you're running on empty. Why are you here? Well, I've come so far, it's too far to go back. 
That won't do. That's going to leave you so vulnerable because you don't know what's around the corner. You don't know what you're going to hit. Well, you need, you need grace for that. You need something for the crisis. Elijah didn't have it. You need to be careful. Don't live like that. Don't say, well, I come along. I know I'm not walking with God, but I guess the kids love it. I'm in church. Put my money in. No, 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 that won't work. You can be emptying yourself out. When the crisis hits, you won't make it. You'll say, oh, I'm out of here. Where's this God then? No, no, you, you weren't walking with him. Be careful. Be careful of that. Sometimes when we're moving such, through such things, we, get, we just get perplexed. We think, Lord, why didn't you tell me? Why don't you explain things? See, sometimes we think, if I, I could endure a setback, I could, I could endure the disappointment if I knew why. If God, if you'd say, well, that, I did that because I was going to do, oh, I see, you were doing that. I just got my eye off. Ah, I see. And sometimes you can endure all kinds of difficulties because actually God had a, another plan. Oh, that, if that wouldn't have happened if that hadn't. Oh, I see, I had to go through that difficulty to get to that. Thanks, that's wonderful. But you don't always see that. God doesn't always explain. You think, but why? That huge question that comes up inside, Why? And some of us want an answer. It's like, I'll trust you when you've explained that one to me. I can't go out in trust again until you give me some explanation for that one. And then you can accumulate those. And that. And why did that happen? And, and we've got to learn, dear friends, he is God and we're not. And he doesn't always explain. If you look at Job and you come at the end, if you think that's an explanation, it doesn't answer my questions God just doesn't explain everything to Job at all. He just says, I'm God. Who are you? <laughs> See, it's God. God helps him to have a right relationship with God. doesn't explain everything. But not having explanation can be tiring. Because if you put it in its column, ah, oh, it's okay now. I can, I can move on. We have to move on not knowing sometimes. We move on hurting, but trusting. And saying, Lord God, you can see me through this. Because all this can build up fear. And fear wants to take you into the future so you get anxious about tomorrow. And Jesus said, don't be anxious about tomorrow. What we can tend to do is project our fears into the future. Our imagination, lying in bed at night, and your imagination's going down the chain. What will happen? What will happen? Listen, don't worry about tomorrow because Jesus is implying grace hasn't got there yet. There'll be grace on the day. If your anxiety runs ahead of God's grace that will be there on the day, you just get into knots and, you, and, you, and you're, you're a living in your imagination. What's going to happen? And maybe, you know what happened to uncle? You know what happened to them? That's going to happen to you. So fear drives you into the future where grace hasn't yet arrived. So live every day. Live, Jesus said quite seriously, don't take anxious thought for tomorrow. Today's enough. And Elijah, he's told... She, You'll die tomorrow. I'm out of here. I have, I, Grace would have been there. It didn't hang around. We need to learn not to do that. He gets really lost into it. He gets really despondent. It gets so low. You can hardly believe it. Is this the same man? Is this really the same man? He says, I've blown it. I'm no better than my father's. He says, he went out into the wilderness. Now, that's probably literally true, but I believe it's probably symbolically relevant. It's like when Judas went out of the upper room before the cross, and, and Jesus spoke to him, and he went out, and, and it says, he went out and it was dark. I'm sure that's got relevance, especially in John's Gospel, where there's lots of stuff about darkness and light. He went out and it was dark. Here, Elijah runs off into the wilderness. Wilderness, where? Nowhere. Out into nothingness. He ran out into the wilderness. And it says, actually, in verse 3, he said he left his servant. Interesting. We, who's, who's his servant? We haven't heard. There was no servant before. Wait, who's the servant? Some people have suggested that maybe the young guy whom he raised from the dead in the widow's home said, can I come with you? Can I be your servant? There's no, actually, no explanation. It's just his servant. Maybe it was the boy. Maybe Elijah's his hero. You know, Elijah, the man of God, he calls fire down from heaven. I'm his servant. Woo, where are we going, Lord? Where are we going, Elijah? And it says Elijah left him. 
It's like, I don't want to look into your searching eyes. I don't want you looking up at me. I'm, I don't know where I'm going. Everywhere else where you see, every other place, it starts with, the Lord said to Elijah, and he arose. The Lord said, and he arose. It's that every time he goes, as God tells him, this is the first time he's out of here. He's just running away. And the servant's looking up. Where are we going? I don't know where I'm going. Go away. I don't, I don't want to say, uh, you stay here. See, when, when you find you're beginning to drift, one of the things that happens to you sometimes is, I don't want to be with the people that knew me when I was doing better. I don't think I'll bother with small group this week. And you begin to drift. I don't, I don't think I'll bother. I don't think I'll go. I don't, I don't like the closeness. I don't like the intimacy. I can hide in the big meeting. I don't, like, I don't want eyes looking. I don't want penetration in my heart. Elijah says, you stay here. You want to watch it? Is that happening to you at all? I just don't want to, don't ask. That's a danger sign. Watch out for that. We want to be open, vulnerable, encouraging from one another. We need one another. Don't cut off people. It says he left him and ran on into total loss of purpose and complete condemnation so that in the end... He has no self-worth left. And see how quickly that happened. And then he prays the suicide prayer. Oh, take my life from me. Now, that is shocking that this great man of God can pray a suicide prayer. It's an amazing eye-opener. And it's amazing, perhaps it's amazed you, that sometimes, and maybe it's happening to you even during this season, you thought, I don't know if I want to live. See, it's shocking how near that is. It's shocking how, what am I just praying? What am I thinking? How quickly that can come. I just want to die. See, sometimes you're shocked. And, God, what am I thinking? And I've been in pastoral ministry long enough to have heard people say, well, if it wasn't for the kids, I just want to finish it all. You think, What? It's amazing how vulnerable you can suddenly be. I believe I'm speaking to people here this morning. You think, I, I, how did I get this low so quickly? And here we see this man saying, I just want to die. Take my life from me. Someone said that's the only prayer Elijah prayed that didn't get answered. He never died. He was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind eventually. But, he prayed the prayer, God, I've had enough. So we painted a pretty black picture. Let's begin to look at the wonderful answers that came. I want to come from our first heading, as it were, which was why did Elijah collapse, to my second heading. He ran out of gas, but he ran into grace. All right? He ran into grace. Let's just see how God responds to Elijah. First of all, we find he doesn't react. It's what he doesn't do is interesting. He doesn't say, goodbye, Elijah, Amos, come and take over. No, it's, he, he doesn't deal harshly with him. He doesn't write him off. He doesn't condemn him, nor does he ignore him. And what we find some interesting things, he begins to show grace in some beautiful ways. And, and sometimes when we, have, we are prone to be quickly spiritual, we can miss some pretty simple things that happen here. First of all, we find that he's allowed to sleep. So I, Elijah's exhausted maybe. The stress, when you think three years of famine, then gather the nation, and when the nation gathers to Carmel, it's not like they've all got cell phones. It's going to take time for that word to get out. It probably took some weeks for that word to get around. All come to Carmel. The nation should gather. Thousands coming. I mean, the stress, the strain, it must have been huge. Huge. He's tired. Sometimes people just get tired. And it's fascinating that the answer is, have a good sleep. Now, you can miss that. It's so obvious because we're thinking, well, there must be a demon in there. What happened to you when you were a little child? Maybe we can... No, no. He's just tired. Do you take seriously the need for a good rhythm, pattern to your life? Do you get enough sleep? Are you careful with your free days off? Do you work in a holiday season? Do you look after yourself? It's a simple thing. You know, sleep. We all, 23rd Psalm, isn't it? The most popular psalm 
The Lord's my shepherd. Wow, what does he do for me? First thing, he makes me lie down. Wow, that's amazing. That's the first thing about my shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd. He makes me lie down. Wow, what is that telling me? It's telling me I can rest. Jesus said, I come not to be served, but to serve. It's an extraordinary thing. John Piper wrote a great book for pastors called Brothers, We Are Not Professionals and wrote some breathtaking chapters. And one of them is, pastors, teach your people, Jesus came to serve, not be served. Don't drive yourself. Don't push yourself. Jesus said, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. Learn of me. You'll find rest for your soul. Cast your care on the Lord. He'll care for you. It's wonderful. He's the Savior. He's not looking for religious fanatics. He's not looking for, oh, I've got to serve God. I've got to go over No, 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 no. He comes to give you rest deep within. Deep within. He makes you lie down. He makes you think, ah, oh, I can rest. And by resting, I'm not running away. I want to see the contrast in a minute. It's just resting. Just get it right. Don't rush to spiritual answers when maybe, hey, are you just making sure you're getting the right rest? It's important. We mustn't miss it. The Bible says first the natural, then the spiritual. And it's a different context, but it's a principle. First the natural. Hey, you're looking after yourself. You're working, you're making the candle burn both ends. You've got this job and then an evening job, and in the mornings you help them. And you think, I may be on, hey, what's you doing? You need to be careful. You need to be careful. So sleep. Next thing is quite extraordinary too. Food. He gives him food. Gives him something to eat. Now that is an extraordinary thing. You think, well, here's a guy. He's in serious trouble. He's run away from Jezebel. And God's giving him something to eat. And, and look at the contrast between when he was obe obedient. Notice when he's obedient. This is one of the most wonderful revelations of grace, I think, in the Bible. There's a man. God says to him, arise, go to the brook. He goes to the brook. The ravens will feed you. Okay. You know, there's the water. There's the raven. Here comes the daily raven. Whack. You know, how are you today? Whack. You know, anybody talking about me? Whack. Anything on the blogs? Whack. You think nothing. Just a blonk of meat. Oh, thank you. Tomorrow, blonk of meat. You know, that's when he's being obedient. When he runs away, you think, well, he's now running away. What happens now? Angels run after him and feed him. You think, what? That, well, you're a funny God. How come? Because God is kind of an upside down. He does things so different to what you'd expect. He's breathtaking in his values. It says in one place in the story of David that he was pursuing, I think it was after Ziklag, and one of, one of the soldiers of the foreign army, he's sick, and David comes upon him, he says, what's happened? And he says, well, my master, seeing I was sick, left me. God's not like that. God is not like that. He says, oh, sick. No, 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 not like that. Angels, come and feed him. Angels, come to his aid. It's amazing. God is so different. It's like Peter. Peter is told by Jesus, take care. The enemy's after you. He says, ah, no, others may deny you. Others may forsake you. I will never fail you. That's Peter, full of confidence, full of himself. And Jesus says, listen, Satan's desire to have you. He's going to sift you, but I've prayed for you. And then you find what happens. Peter, having seen Jesus manhandled, taken away, He's scared. He suddenly, fear gets to him, and the girl says, hey, you've got a Galilean accent. Aren't you with him? No, I don't know him. No, surely you're, no. And it says he's cursed. Now, that doesn't mean just slang. It means he took an oath. He swore. It's that, in that Bible sense of swearing. He took an oath. As God lives, I don't know him. That's what he did. And then we find that after the resurrection, he's gone fishing, and Jesus comes to meet him, you know the story. And there he is on, on the side of the lake. And Peter comes. I'm sure he's kind of avoiding Jesus' eye. And what's happened? Well, Jesus has got, have you had any breakfast? Well, um, I wasn't thinking of breakfast. I was thinking of denial, forsaking, swearing. Uh, breakfast wasn't high in my, th no, no. Have some breakfast. I've done some fat breakfast for you. It's amazing. He gives him breakfast. He gives him something to eat. That's the sort of God you've got. 
that when you mess up, run away, make you think, oh God, I'm disqualified, he's made breakfast for you. It's incredible. No wonder we love him. No wonder we worship him. No wonder we serve him. It's not out of, you've got to, it's out of, Lord, where else do I want to go when I've found a God like this? So he gave him food. And then he let him run. He said, you know, you, you've got a long way to go. You think, where? He's not even told him to go anywhere. And so he, he let him run. He gave him space. He wasn't in his face. He wasn't, what do you think you're doing? It's supposed to be my servant. What are you playing at? You let me down, you wretch. No, he just let him run. Give him space. God knows our needs. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're psychologically con- complicated people. And he gave him sleep and food to run. Just rest. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's a real turning point because from this point on, Elijah's no longer running away. He's running somewhere. He's seen enough to get him. Uh, uh, until now, he's escaping. See, so much in the world of stress is simple escapism. So we, we better legalize cannabis because so many executives use it at the weekend. So many people escape into drugs. So you just, they better change the law. Come on, let's face it. That's the debate that's going on in our country. Because you need to escape. You need to get out. You need to get away. Get away. Get away from, let's move. Get away from this job. Let's move away from here. Let's get somewhere else. Move away from this wife. Go somewhere. I just need to get away. Elijah wants to get away. But after this revelation, he's not running away anymore. He's running to Horeb. It's not escapism anymore. See, there's, escapism is a waste of time. Escapism is, well, try this drug. It'll kind of get you out of it. No, that, after that, you come back down into it. You move away. The people are just the same there. The situation, no, no, no. You've got the problem in here. You move, you take it with you. Escapism is no answer. Elijah's trying to run away. He's trying to escape. I can't handle it. I've run out. I've got nothing more to give. I want to find somewhere else to be. And then he finds God's feeding him and letting him sleep. And God, you're amazing. What happens? Now he runs, but he doesn't run away. He runs to the mountain of God. What does that mean? It says he ran to Horeb, the mountain of God. That's another name for Sinai. And it's the place where God revealed himself. It's the place where Moses first encountered God. And God said to him, my name is I am that I am. I'm God. I don't change. It's the place where the mountain shook Lightning, thunder, trumpet, Ten Commandments. God took two million people into covenant relationship with him. Where their history was hammered out, where the rock displayed and manifested himself. I am your rock. And Elijah stops running into nothing and starts running back to what he knows to be true. Do you need to do that this morning? We're going to break bread very shortly. I want to encourage you, when you come to break bread, if, you've, if you know, oh Lord, I know I've, I've been disappointed. I've, I've lost it. I, it's not like it used to be. Come, run back to him. Breaking of bread's a good place to do that, isn't it? Isn't it? <coughs> Come back to what you know. Come back to the covenant-keeping God. That's what Elijah was doing. He's going back to the God who promised covenant in history. Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Come back to the covenant God. Don't just come and take some bread, dip it in the wine. Come back to God. Will you do that this morning? Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've really missed you. I've drifted from you. I'm so sorry. I want to come back to what I know to be true. But then not only coming back into grace, but encountering God himself, my Final heading, coming to God himself. It's interesting. What does God do? Well, God, first of all, asks him a very penetrating question. What are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Notice this. You see, in modern thinking, we tend to feel, well, I'm just a mass of emotions. And we tend to use the word feel a lot. 
I don't feel God loves me. I don't feel things are working out. I don't feel that these brothers care for me. I don't feel, and we use the word feel. We become very feeling orientated and, and, and we lose reality actually. We really lose hard, solid facts and get into, well, the way I feel about this. No, that won't work. That won't work for you. And so the word that Jesus asked, or at least God asked him in the Old Testament, is this. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now he gave him space. He gave him food. He gave him sleep. Now he's moving in. And he says, Elijah, what are you doing? Now, in doing that, he's reminding him, you have a name and a history. You're not a mass of feelings. And sometimes we can feel, I'm hopeless, I feel so bad. That does not stop you being who you actually are. And you have history with God. You have relationship with God. You have relationship with the God of history. Your walk with God is not a load of feelings which come and go. Your walk with God is a walk with a God of historical reality who's made covenant promises. It's good, isn't it? See, the believer knows too much in the end to run into a vacuum. You know too much. What are you doing? I'm just running away. No, 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 you know too much. And when you come, he says, now what are you doing here, Elijah? And he uses that name. He speaks to him. It's similar with with Simon Peter again. When Simon's having breakfast with Jesus by the lake, he says, Simon, three times he says it, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Notice that, use of name again. Like Elijah, what are you doing here? Like, come on, I know you. I know son of, I know where you come from, son of Jonah. I know who you are. Come on, we've got history. God would say to some of you this morning, come on, we've got history. Come on. You're not a mess. You're my son, you're my daughter. You're going through a difficult time, but I know you, I'm speaking to you. Come on, what are you doing? What are you doing here? Why are you here? What's happening? Why have you let this happen to you? So he asks you that question. What are you doing? Why are you drifting? Why did you run away? He's coming in now, speaking. And then you get this incredible firework display. Wind, fire, earthquake, rocks, whoa. And it says God wasn't in any of them. I guess sometimes you can be kind of feeling spiritually a bit out of it. And, and you can come sometimes to a big meeting and, and you feel, God, everybody's it's like a firework display, power here, but God's not in it for me. I just don't feel his nearness. I, I know it's big, but I know it's powerful, but... So you then you find this beautiful thing. He says he spoke to him in a gentle whisper. It's a fresh experience of God's intimacy. For me, this is the turning point of the whole story. He spoke to him in a gentle whisper. Don't you love that? When God comes to you afresh, when God whispers to you about his personal love for you, it says in Psalm 18, I was reading this morning, Psalm 18, 35, your gentleness makes me great. Now actually, Psalm 18 is a wonderful psalm. It's repeated twice in Scripture. It's, I think it's 1 Samuel 22, and it's repeated again because it's just so rich. And it's David saying, God, you're amazing. You rescued me. You taught my hands to battle, how to bow, uh, b- uh, bend a bow of bronze. You, you made me a fighter. And then in the midst of this incredible chapter about fighting and warfare, he says this, your gentleness makes me great. Isn't that amazing? That a warrior like David says, no, it's God's gentleness actually that just frees me. It's your gentleness that makes me great. He says similarly in the same psalm, Psalm eighteen nineteen, you rescued me because you delighted in me. Just to know that. He whispers, I delight in you. That's phenomenal. That when, you, when God comes to you and tells you, I love you, it's like you can take on the world. You just know that's enough. He's so powerful, but he knows me, he loves me. Yeah, he can make the rocks fall, he can make earthquake, and, but he loves me. It's just in, That's all you need. He just whispers it into your heart afresh. He makes it real to you. He brings it into your heart. That word delight, I love the word delight, don't you? It's, a, it's such a rich word. It's more than love. It's delight, it's like love with fireworks. It's like, I delight in you. And uh, it's just exciting love. I looked it up in the dictionary, and uh, it, 
it just came a couple of words, wasn't terribly interesting. So I, I thought I'd look in the thesaurus. You know, thesaurus doesn't uh, give definition of a word. It gives you lots of similar words that kind of the friends it keeps. And uh, here's the words that next to delight in the thesaurus. So just think of this is God's view of you, of us this morning as he looks on his church. He calls the church, my delight is in her. That's one of the names for the church. He delights in us. Here, here are some words in the thesaurus. Laugh, smile, get a kick out of, hug oneself. I've got a little grandchild in my house at the moment, staying this weekend, and she's uh, full of fun. But when she gets excited, she hugs herself. Imagine God delights in you. God, these words fit. Purr, that's a good one, purr. Imagine the, hev- the heavens begin to shake and the angels are, what's going on? God purring over his church. Boom. You know, God, <laughs> rave, bask in, wallow, enjoy, have fun, exhilarate, relish, elate, thrill, intoxicate, ravish, entrance, enrapture. Wow. What words are these? What words are these? It says in Song of Solomon, one glance of her of your eyes ravish my heart, my sister, my bride. You ever fallen in love? Been in a room? Think, I wonder if she's noticed me. I wonder if she knows I'm alive. And then she glances across and looks straight at you. And you think, oh, she's looking at me. Oh, oh. One glance of her eyes has ravished. That's what it says in Song of Solomon. It's like we just look up at Jesus. Lord, have a good look. Ah, oh, one glance of your eyes has ravished my heart. I delight in my church. God delights in you. And if we haven't discovered that, if we're just religious and we haven't discovered that, we miss the point. If you're not a Christian yet, this is a mystery It's almost impossible for you to consider. God is personal and loves you more than you could ever dream possible. And you're thinking, I want to escape. I want to get out. I'll just try looking at church this morning. Maybe. Who knows? I want to tell you about a God whose love is real, fortifies you, helps you to cope with life. I want to be honest, Christians, I'm speaking to Christians here this morning, we go through setbacks, we go through bewildering seasons, we find what happened. I'm saying, come on Christians, come back, enjoy what you're supposed to be enjoying. I'm saying to you who don't know Jesus, where are you running to? Running away from reality. There's nowhere to run. You have to come to God. You have to come to Jesus. And he loves you. And you find, wow, I am loved by God, and it's real. So he delights in him. He says in one of the famous old hymns, loved with everlasting love, led by grace that love to know, spirit breathing from above, gentle whisper, thou hast taught me it is so. Love with everlasting love. Just to ponder that. Just take time out, dear friends. Let God speak of his tender love for you. Breathing, he breathes a gentle whisper, he just restores your soul. He makes me lie down, Psalm 23, he restores my soul. Why? It needs restoring. God knows. The psalmist knew we need restored souls because we get stressed out. But Jesus can do it for us. My very last point, he gave him a new commission. He reinstated him and gave him a new commission. He said, now return on your way. He doesn't say, run along. Now I've had a good talk to you. Run along. He doesn't say that. He says, return on your way. When you have arrived, I love that phrase. It's not like, get out. No, no. When you have arrived, anoint some kings. Elijah might have thought, I used to speak to kings. No, no. Anoint. He's a king maker now. And not only that, train Elisha, the prophet. I want another one like you. You want another one like me? I'm good enough to die. No, I want another one like you. Get him to be like you. And you'll find, we sometimes think it's quick handover. No, no, there's an overlap of several years. Several years, Elijah and Elisha. You see the story overlapping? Several years, Elijah and Elisha. He poured water on the hands of Elijah. He was his servant. Get to know him. I want another one like you. It's like Peter was told, feed my sheep. You're back with me? Right, here's something for you to do. 